We doing this again! Welcome to the new episode of Type Moon Character Showcase, the series where I take a character from the Nasuverse and share them to you all, regardless of how popular or obscure they are. As a goal of this series is to introduce to you all the unique and interesting characters of the Nasuverse that you probably don't know everything about or just don't know at all. I delve into their character and backstory, explain their abilities and character quirks, and finish it all off with some personal thoughts. This episode, we'll be delving into a series that, at this point of recording, is the only Nasuverse work outside of Fate to get a full anime adaptation that actually adapts the story decently. Today, I present to you all the wonderful, the cute, the eggplant, Fujino Asagami, commonly nicknamed Fujinon. Fujino is a major character in one of the arcs of Karno Kyokai, specifically Lingering Pain, or Tsukaku Zanryu Ever Cry Ever Life. It is the third part of the light novels and was adapted into the third movie of the Karno Kyokai series. Fujino Asagami isn't a major character of the entire series, but in this arc, she is arguably more of a main character than the actual main characters of the overall series, and she herself has also become relatively popular with fans. With that being said, let's talk about her character and backstory. Fujino is the daughter of the Asakami family, one of the four major demon hunting families, the others being Fujo, Ryogi, and Nanaya. These demon hunting families had supernatural abilities of some sort, and were hired to hunt humans of mixed blood. They used to be important in older human societies, but in more modern ages, people of mixed blood have compromised with normal humans, and through growing strong alliances with people in power, have grown into families of great power themselves like that of the Tono. Due to this change in society, the demon hunting families quickly lost their own high status in the modern world and are now dying out. Out of the four families, the Asakamis ended up with the worst fate. The family previously had two branches. The main branch was Asakami, while the minor one was Asagami. The Asakami in the modern age has almost completely collapsed, as some members worship the same mixed bloods they sought to kill. Due to this constant counterintuitive worship, ironically, they themselves almost completely became mixed bloods and collapsed onto themselves due to this. However, while the Asakami family was in shatters, the Asagami branch actually managed to survive, and has become a business organization to survive in a modern society. When she was born, Fujino was able to inherit the powers of the Asakamis, but in response, her father used medication to seal it away. It was mostly successful, as while she could still use minor telekinesis, it wasn't very strong. However, due to taking so much medicine to seal her powers away, she also lost her sense of pain as a side effect, and grew up with no memory of the feeling of pain. This lack of sensation gave her a detached view of reality where she could not comprehend something without experiencing it herself firsthand. She had an emptiness in a sense, one that she could not ever fill. This mentality, of course, is due to her origin of nothingness. One day, during a sports event, Fujino would injure her leg, and tried to hide the fact that she did not feel pain so that others would view her as normal. This was so she could validate herself as a normal person in the modern world. However, a random boy by the name of Mikia Kokuto came up to her and told her that pain wasn't something that she should just bear, that it was something to speak up about. He took care of her and carried her home out of pure heartedness, and that illogical kindness that Mikia showed to her made her fall in love with him, and she would forever treasure that time as her happiest moment. Years later, she became a student of the prestigious school known as the Reigns Girls Academy, becoming friends with Asuka Kokuto, who she did not know was the sister of the boy she loved. She was one of the few students allowed to go outside of the academy in limited times in order to have medical appointments with doctors in Mifune Town. However, due to this, she was unfortunately targeted by a local gang due to her status as a student of the prestigious girls' school. The gang would periodically snatch her into alleyways and constantly rape her. Despite this, Fujino felt little about the situation due to her detachment from reality and inability to feel. The gang eventually got bored of simply violating her and struck her in the back with a metal bat to elicit some form of reaction. Unfortunately, it worked, and the shock from the strike made her regain her sensation to pain. For the first time in ages, she truly hurt. And not only that, but they also awakened her full powers yet again, including the usage of her mystic eyes of distortion, a rare kind of mystic eye. They later pulled out a knife and intended to stab her, and the pain she felt during that moment made her lash out in retaliation, killing all the gang members except for Keita Minato, who managed to escape. In fear of what Keita would reveal to the world and being branded as a murderer as a result, Fujino limped out into the streets despite the immense pain. 
It was there she would encounter Miki again, who said similar things to what he said to her in the past, taking care of her. However, she left his place afterwards and encountered Soren Araya, who helped heal her back. He had motives, of course, but we'll talk about those in another episode. Now being able to walk properly again, Fujino chased after Keita in order to silence him for good. She looked for him in whatever way she could. She would ask Keita's acquaintances, and would kill them with her mystic eyes when they tried to escape or retaliate. These killings would eventually become public, and the Garan no Do would be hired to solve the case. This made her encounter Shiki Ryogi, who wasn't phased or surprised by the killings, instead seemingly enjoying them, which shocked Fujino that such a person like this could exist. When Shiki confronted her about them being similar in how they both take pleasure in the death of others, she denies it, claiming that she was a normal person. They prepare to fight, but Fujino mysteriously loses focus, and Shiki quickly loses the will to kill her, telling her to stop searching for Keita, else the situation get worse. As the killings continued though, Fujino eventually killed an innocent man, prompting Shiki to go and fight Fujino once and for all. Fujino goes to a large suspension bridge on a pouring night to feel the beating of the summer rain she wants to remember. She remembers her meetings with Mikia, how she feels that pain she feels detaches her from her own memory of that moment. She feels she is unworthy of that memory for committing murder, and how she feels that the rain helps her cleanse her being. It is there, in that state, where she confronts Shiki again. Shiki warned her that she shouldn't have continued her search, and that she was now already engrossed in murder. Fujino questions whether Shiki was talking about her or herself. Shiki replies that they were one and the same, people who find joy in death, and that at this time, she certainly felt very alive. With that, the two began their clash. During their battle, Miki and Toko learned that the truth to the situation was that she never got stabbed by the knife, and that she actually had a terminal case of appendicitis instead. She mistook the pain from it as the knife attack, and thus actually retaliated before the knife truly struck. However, it was not a misunderstanding either, as if she didn't do the act, she would have actually been stabbed. Kokuto tries to find a way for Fujino to be saved and treated, but Toko reveals that it was her surrogate father who hired them for the case in the first place, and himself told them to kill Fujino for the atrocities she committed. She had no hope or salvation even if she was stopped, so it would require a miracle to save her. Back on the bridge, Fujino and Shiki continue their fight, a battle between the ranged mystic eyes of distortion and the close range mystic eyes of death perception. Fujino twists off Shiki's arm in the battle, and as Shiki retreats, Fujino tells herself that she is stronger. Shiki is cornered, but in the fight, had seen Fujino's distortion, and after hiding had learned how it works. Shiki walks out and tells Fujino that her spell is a spiral of red and green, and continuously uses her mystic eyes of death perception to kill the distortions that Fujino casts. Fujino, unable to retaliate, is pinned to the ground. Fujino asks Shiki why she wants to kill her, as she continues to claim that she only killed others from her pain. Shiki laughs, and then asks her why she was smiling and looking like she was enjoying herself. Fujino feels her own mouth, and to her dismay, she was indeed smiling and realized that she had that expression as she killed others. The feeling she felt during her murders was enjoyment. Shiki destroys every last vestige of faith in her own normality by breaking her lie and once again telling her that they were one and the same, people who were detached from their own sense of self and life, people who enjoyed murder. As Shiki was about to kill her, she cries out and screams a desperate call, bend. She sees the bridge in her mind and in desperation, makes the bridge bend with her eyes, destroying it. She opens her eyes to find herself in the destroyed car park with a body racked with pain. She tries to walk but falls to the ground in constant agony. She realizes that she will die and says that she doesn't want to. She recalls her life, her birth, her friends, the boy she loved, the ones who did her wrong, and ultimately says that she wants to keep thinking, asking her mother if it was okay for her to cry. Meanwhile, an injured Shiki approaches her, saying that she should have told others that it hurt. And as she says that, Fujino sees Mikia inside Shiki. Seeing this, Fujino stops everything, stops feeling, and lets herself get stabbed. We later learn that Shiki ended up not killing Fujino, since by the end, Fujino lost her sensation of pain again, and lost her will to kill. So instead, Shiki killed her appendicitis and she gets rushed to the hospital as a victim of the accident, 
being taken care of until she was able to live on her own again. Toko notes from Shiki's report on their fight that she actually achieved true clairvoyance to see what was beyond what should have been seen, and combined with her mystic eyes of distortion, she could have become one of the most powerful humans of the modern age. After the incident, Fujino lost a large majority of her visibility, but thankfully, she is shown to be slowly adjusting to her disability and continues to live. Much later, she meets a girl called Risu Miyazuki, leaving down flowers for her deceased best friend. This is still part of Fujino's story, but the explanation to these characters are very important to it, and they are too minor to have a full spotlight for their own. So for this section, it'll be a mini spotlight on Risu and her best friend as well. Risu is a pessimistic girl with a bleak view on the world and the future. Due to her view on life, Risu jokingly suggested a suicide pact with her best friend so that they could escape life forever. Her best friend was a girl named Yuko Ando, and she was opposed to this. Unlike Risu, Yuko was a girl with an optimistic view on life, and wanted to believe that the world was beautiful. However, Risu took this as a view of betrayal, telling her to die on her own. Yuko would later become one of the victims of the suicides of the Fujo building. And Nisu later found out that Yuko's life was full of suffering, as her mother was found dead and her family abandoned her. The truth to her suicide was a supernatural tampering of Kiri Fujo, but Risu thought that she committed suicide due to her troubled life as well as her own urging of the suicide pact and ignorance of her life, making her feel extreme guilt, thinking it was partially her fault she died. Fujino tells Risu not to brood for her friend, and instead, a pissed off Risu then asks Fujino if she knows the connection between the murders of July and the suicides, a question which Fujino evades. Later, Fujino finds Risu considering a method for suicide, as she decided that she didn't want to live alone and wanted to kill herself to be with her best friend. Fujino asks her if she was playing at the concept of suicide, and an angered Risu claimed that she was indeed going to kill herself and wasn't just playing around. Fujino then revealed her distortion abilities and her secret as the culprit of the killings in July, saying that her twisting would guarantee her death better than any other. Despite this, she then says that she herself did not want to support Risu's endeavor of suicide. Risu then reveals what she thought she did, and that she might as well have been branded as a murderer for being the final reason for Yuko's death. Fujino then says the same words as the late Yuko, that even with all the atrocities in it, she wanted to believe that the world was beautiful. When asked why she knew them, Fujino reveals that Yuko had said the same words to her, and that before, she didn't understand what those words meant. But after the events she took part in, she found herself to be an idiot who committed actions that she could never take back. She realized that she would have to live with the burden of her actions and the blindness she obtained as a result of them. Only after she realized her mistakes, she learned that Yuko's words were a prayer for her, to live happily despite the pain of life, and that Yuko was saying the same for Risu as well. Ultimately, Fujino encourages Risu to accept her mistakes and live on in spite of them, inviting a brand new day as the sun rises from the horizon. In another time, humanity's future was incinerated, including Fujino's timeline. However, Alaya saw her abilities and thus, in order to save the human order, recruited her existence and allowed her to be summoned in Kaldea as an archer-class servant. Similar to Ryogi Shiki, the experience is like an impossibly long dream for her, and would be erased should the human order be saved. Knowing this, Fujino understood her position well, and does her best to become a power that her master can rely on. Fujino is a really, really interesting character. Nasu himself describes her as a straightforward Moe character, and I do see that. She is a character that has a strange, warped view on life thanks to her origin of nothingness, a plague that curses the many heroines of Karano Kyokai. Yet, that isn't even to account her tragic backstory and fate. Simply, the world of Karano Kyokai is a dark place, and Fujino, in a way, is just as much of a victim as everyone else. That's a common thing in Karano Kyokai, and why the English name is the Garden of Sinners. There is no true good and bad. Everyone is a sinner at one point. Even the pure-hearted Mikia can be considered a sinner for wanting to care for even the worst people out there who committed heinous acts. Fujino goes through a lot of learning about herself through her main story, and lived with the many problems that life presented her with. She could not feel pain so she found herself detached from her own self and life, and that emptiness led her to find herself enamored with murder after killing. Even if it was originally in self-defense, 
she still committed atrocities. Being confronted by her own messed up self by the end and living through it was her story. Even after understanding her own mistakes and accepting being haunted by them with her vision taken away, she still moves on and continues to live. Not only that, but also becomes able to encourage others to live as well, becoming similar to Yuko herself. In terms of abilities and quirks, Fujinon has a lot to talk about. First of all is her origin. If you remember, her origin is that of nothingness, just like Chiki Ryogi and Kiri Fujo. The origin of nothingness pretty much guarantees that you'll end up feeling empty and detached from your own sense of self and life due to being an empty being. You become enamored or interested in things that end, commonly the idea of death, as it is the ultimate nothingness for a person. Fujino ends up as one of these people and checks out all the marks. She has common sense, but will never truly understand a concept until she experiences it herself, making her reach for those moments of true comprehension something she could not help but desire despite knowing better. Due to overdosing on medicine to seal away her powers from a young age, Fujino's sense of touch was lost, so she became numb and thus she could not feel pain. She regained them for a short while in the story, but afterwards regained that numbness once again. Fujino's power as an Asakami descendant results in the Mystic Eyes of Distortion, an extremely powerful, unique kind of Mystic Eye of high grade that can create an axis of rotation anywhere in her vision, and allows her to warp the axis tenetically, allowing her to rotate space to her will. Its ability to bend things is virtually unlimited, with the only limits being that she cannot bend things outside of her vision, and she cannot bend true conceptual things like bounded fields or magical barriers. Saying this, if they are built on a non-conceptual foundation, like an object, she can bend those just fine. While her distortion is very strong, similar to Satsuki, her abilities are not very refined as she has no knowledge on magecraft. However, it is stated that under good training and a good teacher, she could become a monster. At the end of her arc, she also gains true clairvoyance, which allowed her to see beyond what the eyes could see and perceive beyond the limits of what is normally possible. This allows her to use her distortion without the need to see it with her own vision, and it also allows her to use her mystic eyes even after she loses her vision. This might seem like just some daredevil level counter to our blindness, but trust me when I say that this ability is broken when paired with her mystic eyes. It allows her to create an axis regardless of size and bend it as long as her clairvoyance reaches it. In theory, she could make an axis as big as the entire fucking planet using this clairvoyance, and could literally destroy it in a single bend, maybe even further. And yes, I have a basis on this which we'll get to later. In the Human Order timelines, she is able to be summoned as a servant in the Grand Order under the Archer class, even though Caster fits way better. Just don't question it. Her parameters as an Archer are the following. She has E-ranked Strength, B-ranked Endurance, D-ranked Agility, A-ranked Mana, C-ranked Luck, and an EX-ranked Noble Phantasm. As for class skills, she has Magic Resistance D, which resists enough to cancel simple spells. She has Independent Action A, which allows her to remain in a long distance from a master and pull off high-cost mana spells even without a master. She gains a high ranking because she has a habit of taking lonely strolls, and due to her numbness, she does not notice the pain from a lack of magical energy. Finally, she surprisingly has Territory Creation B, which allows her to create a workshop for Magecraft despite the fact that she has no magecraft knowledge. Sure, Nasu. In terms of active skills, she has Mystic Eyes of Distortion EX. Her Mystic Eyes, which we already talked about. She also has Clairvoyance Darkness C, a variant of Clairvoyance that includes the uniqueness of having it despite an inability to see. And finally, she has Residual Pain, which records the residual pain caused by her appendicitis in the events she took part in. Her null phantasm is Vijinaptromatora, Mystic Eyes of Distortion. It is an anti-world EX rank noble phantasm. It is her ability to combine her mystic eyes with her clairvoyance, representing how she can have an omniscient view on anything in the perspective of an outsider using her clairvoyance, allowing her to use her eyes virtually anywhere and at any size. This is solid evidence that Fujino can use her abilities to destroy a planet or even more if she needed to. And while basic is extremely fucking powerful for what is essentially a human with some supernatural blood. Overall, Fujino is a strong user of the Mystic Eyes of Distortion, and with her abilities, allows her to become a huge force to be reckoned with. As Shiki and Toko said, she is currently one of the most powerful humans of her timeline. 
And while she's not got any conceptual or mind-blowing insane powers like destroying reality and glimpsing at the truth of something, an ability that can theoretically destroy the world is not one to be looked down upon. In terms of personal thoughts, well, Fushino Asagami is my personal favorite character in the entirety of Kai no Kyokai, and that's no shade on Kai no Kyokai. Chikiryogi is still amazing as a character and one of the most interestingly written protagonists in my opinion, but overall, Fujino is ultimately my preference. For one, I find her to be really charming. Her cute personality is something I enjoy and as Nasu said, she's basically a serious Moe character, and I like that. However, what really sold me on her and made me love her as much as I do is, of course, her character development and backstory. A large unifying trend of my favorite characters is they elicited some form of either empathy or sympathy, and Fujino falls into that category. Heck, a reason for my favorite waifu to be, well, my favorite, is because I felt more sympathy to her than literally any other moment in my life with anything else. Even myself, but let's not talk about that. However, we'll talk about that character later, cause she is in Type Moon. And no, she's not Sakura. I do like her though. I could just see and understand how she got her messed up view on the world, even if I didn't get it personally. And ultimately her finding out her own warped view and her forced acceptance of how she was like was interesting. She was a victim, but even if she didn't intend to do things the way she did, she still did them under her own politician. She is a sinner, and she learns that by the end. What really got me to love this character though was the bonus scene she had with Risu. It is only then that we actually see Fujino as a character grown from the events that conspired. By the end of her arc, we are implying that she has to live with the guilt of her actions once she learned of her own nature and the actions she took. And I hope that this character I sympathize with would accept that peacefully and do her best to live on. But. Oh my Fujino, you pulled off so much more than I hoped you would. We see her later, grown from her mistakes and passing lessons herself. She helped teach Risu the value of living and encouraged her to live on, even with the sins she committed. She herself realizes her actions as a murderer are something she has to carry, but she continues to live on optimistically, with those blood-stained hands and helps impart that knowledge for others as well. I broke apart in pure joy when I saw that. As I hoped she would, Fujino had learned and had become a much better person by the end, looking forward to the next day and does her best to help others feel the same way too. This is as good of an end that this character could possibly obtain and I was so happy to see that. I just love her, I really do. She had a very well done character arc, and it all paid off spectacularly by the end. Ultimately, Fujifu holds the crown of my favorite character from Karno Kyokai, for being the girl that learned how messed up she was and lived on with the full weight and guilt of she carries, helping others who experience the same thing. Oh, Fujino, you were amazing! Anyway, that concludes this episode of Tight Moon Character Showcase. I hope you enjoyed me talking about this precious eggplant that deserves all the respect and love this world could give. With that being said, please continue watching this series and look forward to the next episode of Tight Moon Character Showcase. For now, I'll take my leave. See ya!